Thank you. Um, so our first two sets of speakers are from uh, Kenya, and they're going to talk about um, the re research and conservation initiatives to assist two highly threatened species. In a moment, we're going to hear from, uh, in a, or in a few minutes, we're going to hear from uh, Samuel Bakari, uh, who is a uh, local conservation leader on the Kinangot Plateau in central Kenya. Uh, Samuel has worked with the Friends of Kinangot Plateau for over 10 years, uh, helping to design and initiate many important conservation projects. Samuel holds an MSc in Ecology and Evolution from Groningen University in the Netherlands, as well as a first degree from uh, from from his home country. Um, he also, in his in his day job, works as the director of natural resources for Nyandarua County Council um, in central Kenya. Um, first, we're going to hear from Lawrence Wagura, um, and Lawrence is an ecologist and founder and director of Natural Resource Africa Concern, which is an NGO that focuses on conservation oriented research, habitat conservation and community development. Um, Mr. Wagura has been involved in research on critically threatened birds in Taita Hills in southeast Kenya uh, for at least 10 years. And uh, this morning, uh, Lawrence is going to talk to us um, about the probably the most threatened of those species, the Taita Apalis, and some of his work, uh, which has informed the conservation efforts, which are continuing within the Taita Hills. Um, Lawrence, are you, please go ahead. Are you able to share your screen? Okay, thank you, Paul. Let me, let me try. Can Wonderful. everyone see the screen? Coming. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, right, thank you so much, Paul, for that introduction. Um, and I would like to thank KBC for giving us this platform um, to present about our work. Uh, yeah. Myself um, and the team uh, are really grateful. So I'll be presenting on the uh, population threats of the Apalis fusicularis, the Peter Apalis, uh, from our long-term surveys in the Peter Hills, Kenya, uh, which we've been conducting together with, uh, with my team. Uh, I'll be quick in my presentation, because I understand I only have um, 15 minutes. Um, so we'll jump straight ahead to the presentation. So our work is based in the Taita Hills, which is part of um, Eastern Arc Mountain. As we all know, Eastern Arc Mountains, um, uh, one of the global biodiversity hotspots. Um, it consists uh, or it consists of um, 13 mountain block. Um, and Taita Hills is the only block in the Kenyan side. So the rest are in the Tanzania uh, side. So the whole Eastern Arc block is um, have suffered massive deforestation in the past, with the Taita Hills suffering the most. Uh, currently, um, Taita Hills are uh, only about 98% of the natural uh, forest remains. I mean, only 2% remain, 98% 90, is gone, um, uh, mostly to, to settlement. Uh, so the remaining portion, uh, it's about 500 of, of forests, it's about 500 hectares uh, that is confined in tiny patches of forest, uh, which are, are really fragmented. But despite, uh, but despite this, uh, Taita Hills um, boast the highest number of uh, endemism uh, among the mountain blocks uh, per unit uh, area. So for both uh, flora and fauna, so the floral species uh, have endemic species ranging from mammals, birds, you know, reptiles, amphibians, uh, and insects. Uh, some of these have really a uh, tiny restricted range. Um, our study species is this uh, beautiful uh, medium-sized warbler, 
which is endemic to the Taita Hills. Uh, the male and female shows a slight uh, uh, morphological difference with the male having um, um, a darker um, throat uh, than the female. Uh, the habitat preference is in the, in the uh, thickets inside the forest, uh, prefer the gaps inside the forest, and also along the forest edge. Well, they have a territory size of about uh, 0 0.9 hectares, um, and they they construct their nest uh, in the weak bushes, I would say, uh, weak herbaceous uh, vegetation, uh, where they lay three to, you know, two to three eggs. Uh, so we, since 2009, we have carried out um, uh, consistent uh, research work um, and our key research activities have included uh, demographic studies um, uh, using various uh, approach, which include uh, point count surveys. We've done ringing. We've done extens extensive study on breeding ecology and uh, monitoring of nesting activities, so, and also habitat preference. Uh, we have carried out radio tracking to understand about the species movement and territory size. We have also done uh, quite a lot on mapping different habitats um, uh, just to inform uh, uh, or to assess uh, priority sites for restorations. We conducted the uh, restoration pilot project uh, also to guide on, um, on proper approach uh, in uh, restoration of uh, of these areas that are uh, occupied uh, with uh, exotic invasive species. Uh, from our findings, uh, what comes clear uh, out clear is that uh, this species uh, population is has is suffering a really sharp decline and even uh, local extinction. Um, in the in the work done in 1999, um, around there, I confirmed these species in uh, seven forest fragments. And, and the population then was uh, over 600 individuals. So our work uh, uh, between uh, uh, actually 2010 to 2013, we confirmed um, local extinction uh, in three forest species, uh, in three forest fragments. Uh, well, that's Mololo, Chawia, and Furu. Uh, that was a span of about four years. And currently, as we speak, the global population stands at less than 200 individuals. And this is supported by all. Uh, the, this entire population is hosted um, in two forest species, in two forest fragments, sorry, uh, which are Buria and Gangao. Uh, because of that one, uh, which is Yale, uh, host only a single pair, which we cannot term as a, you know, as a viable uh, population. Uh, I might, must mention that these this um, uh, analysis that you see here uh, is still a preliminary uh, from the paper that we are working on. Uh, so it's still, it still might, it might need some fine tuning uh, uh, as it is. Uh, our major the, the the major causes that we have identified for this decline uh, and even local extinction, uh, uh, there are several, uh, including high predation rate, uh, fragmentation, low nesting success, um, low post fledging survival rates, and apparently we think uh, even uh, the climate change it's involved in some way. And all these uh, these factors you see here are somehow overarching. So we drew out our, our monitoring of surveys. Uh, we have observed uh, serious uh, high or seriously high predation rates. Um, our camera traps have been able to capture uh, various predators uh, that include, um, if you can see the photos clearly, uh, you notice some of these predators. Uh, so the first one showing um, a sight monkey uh, stalking the nest. 
And actually, the next uh, photo, you can see it has succeeded in uh, predicting the next. We have had, uh, um, you know, rodents like uh, dormouse in the next photo, uh, that photo. Uh, uh, apparently, even uh, Galago uh, was surprised to also capture Galago. And uh, uh, snakes as well. Uh, we have had uh, several raptors, so it's quite a uh, uh, huge number of predators. Um, yeah, on low nesting success, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, low nesting success, you can uh, 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 observe in the graph um, there. It's really affecting the population in a big way. Uh, and uh, even to expound more on this, uh, on that simple table below there, uh, in 2021, in 2020, 2021 breeding season, you, for example, in one of the fragments called Gangao, uh, we have uh, 15 territories, uh, out of which uh, 12 uh, uh, were actively, 12 pair were actively nesting. And these 12 pair had uh, 61 attempt, nesting attempts, which all failed. You know, for the whole season, we had no, no success in nesting. And uh, if you look also at the, uh, the fragment below, Buria, uh, we had uh, 39 territories, in the entire uh, uh, fragment. Uh, 27 had nesting activities. Um, uh, which had uh, and they had about one well, thirty attempts. Uh, by that I mean uh, every time an apalis or pair try to nest and it fails, uh, as long as they will be within the breeding season, they will attempt again. Some of these uh, um, pairs attempt even five times, uh, just trying their luck. So uh, in total, these twenty-seven um, pairs had one well, thirty uh, attempts. Uh, and out of these, only 126, uh, or all the 126 failed, and uh, only seven fledglings that made uh, uh, that succeeded. So you can clearly see how these uh, low nesting success, and to some extent, uh, even post fledging survival rates, is affecting the population. Uh, uh, fragmentation. It's also a, a, a contributing factor. Uh, we, uh, sp a sp a example of these forests, uh, of some of these forests, you can see this is one of the forest fragment called Yale. And uh, according to our study, we can tell it's in the right uh, uh, elevation. Uh, but since it's very tiny, uh, have only a small portion of, um, of natural forest and it's surrounded by exotic uh, species. So there's no uh, really space for, uh, for uh, any upcoming uh, population. So the area is so restricted, there's no room for new, new territories, and this affects the population. For a long time, I, I think before we had about uh, five territories, we currently have only a single, uh, single pair uh, surviving there. Uh, we also uh, believe that climate change is, uh, is involved in this. And the reason why we believe in this is because um, uh, the extinction, uh, the local extinction, and even the low nesting success is somehow correlated with, um, with, the, with the altitude of the elevation. Uh, uh, I must mention that this is just uh, our observation. Uh, that may require uh, further investigation. Uh, now, uh, with these uh, statistics, uh, it's really clear that uh, uh, this species could become um, extinct in the near future if nothing is really, uh, if serious work of you know, conservation is not uh, well executed. And this, uh, of course, could become the first African bird species, of, you know, to become extinct in the 21st century. So we are trying to, to uh, we are attempting some conservation measures. Some of our 
these conservation measures that we, we are undertaking, undertaking currently, those that we have undertaken already, they include um, uh, eradication of invasive species to, exp to expand the habitats uh, in the tighter hills forest. Uh, we have uh, uh, done land lease uh, and patches also to accommodate or to protect those species, especially those those territories that are uh, are in in um, in uh, private land. We have done uh, quite a lot in terms of training and awareness, uh, just to strengthen local community, uh, local capacity. Uh, who uh, we we can uh, uh, you know we can trust in protecting the existing uh, uh, habitats and species. We are lobbying also for the proper policies from the government, local government, and national government. Uh, and we are doing a lot in terms of uh, restoring, uh, you know, planting, you know, uh, planting uh, trees in areas that we clear of the these exotic invasive species. Um, we are working with the community, especially in supporting uh, their livelihoods, uh, just to help alleviate the uh, poverty uh, uh, for the local communities, most of whom are you know, live below poverty line. And of course, we are, we, we continue to carry out uh, uh, monitoring and surveys uh, to follow up on this uh, population threat uh, of these um, endemic, uh, you know, uh, endemic threatened species, as well as other, other species from other taxa uh, that suffer the same, the same problem. So this is uh, just uh, uh, some of our work uh and the, and the approach you know activities and approach that we we are currently undertaking and i must uh, say that uh, we have already succeeded in clearing all the exotic species and, and working on enrichment of this uh, you know, good restoration plan of about 44.5 acres uh, we've cleared invasive species and uh, currently uh, planting trees working with the community closely uh, establishing nurseries and planting on the sites uh, and also clearing these exotic species. Uh, we have also uh, managed to acquire, uh, uh, especially uh, in terms of lease, we have leased about 14 acres of land in that, uh, if everybody can see the map, we have that uh, portion map, marked with the um, uh, red. So this has been done um, with the support of AB, uh, African Land Club and Rainforest. We have really assisted in this uh, leasing of this land uh, because we have existing territories in there and it falls under private land. So we have leased this land for 15 years and hopefully um, this uh, can be extended um, after 15 years. We have uh, also bought um, uh, eight acres uh, of land in uh, in uh, that portion of um, you know marked with the um, uh, maroon, uh, and this uh, this area also contains several uh, several territories of the palace. You can see the 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 blue uh, uh, dots uh, that shows territories existing territories. So this this is a good uh, or oh, it's really uh, a good success. Uh, in protecting the, 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 this number of territories that exist there. And this uh, we're doing as we continue to restore, uh, the, uh, like especially the area marked with, the, um, with pink, uh, that's a community land that we are currently restoring, uh, hope, hoping that uh, uh, by the time the area is restored, by, or the, by the time the lease is ended, uh, this portion will be already restored and if there's no room for for this lease extension, then we 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 at least we have somewhere that uh, these species can establish territories. Uh, another thing that we are trying to do uh, in our effort to conserving uh, habitats for these species is uh, is uh, restoring areas between. Uh, this forest fragment, just to create corridors that we believe are really uh, important uh, 
you know, to allow, uh, you know, the, the interaction of these subspecies between uh, these forest uh, fragments. Uh, well, with that uh, 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 number that we're mentioning and how, you know, imagining how vulnerable uh, this species uh, population is, uh, the big question that we've been asking ourselves, uh, and I think which everybody should, uh, you know, think about is uh, uh, one, how long would this data policy sing? And of course, are we, are we really doing enough? Uh, to conserve, or make, this, make sure that this species uh, does not become extinct. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank um, uh, uh, these organizations uh, for supporting our work. Uh, we are really grateful. Thank you so, so much for listening. Lawrence, that was uh, Wes. Um, very insightful. Thank you for that. Um, could I ask you some questions? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, you know, when a when a when a species falls to a a, a number like two hundred, the, the question becomes whether it's below recovery rate um, in terms of just having enough DNA uh, within the the the, the cohort. Um, have you uh, or any other groups looked at? captive breeding programs to protect them, particularly from the predatory uh, species that seem to be, we've got two things as far as your report goes. One is climate change, um, yeah. and I'm gonna to come to that in a minute. And the second one is, it, it seems to be that they're being predated a lot by other species. And of course, the problem with uh, habitat loss is that more and more species get forced together in a closer, uh, environment. So they're all, uh, whereas before they would have been spread out, um, the raptors and the monkeys and other things are all in the same environment. Um, have you looked at captive breeding at all? Or is that a, a and what would it cost? And do you think it could be successful? Uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, yes, it's something that we're really keen on. Uh, we've been uh, having a serious discussion about, about this. Uh, together with the team. And in fact, uh, we are trying to look for funding for this, um, for this just for, because I, I, I trust that uh, captive breeding is not an easy thing. It involves mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, we want to, we were, we were, we were come to a discussion. We want to see how we can first um, get prepared. Okay. Uh, what do we need uh, and uh, how can we approach? Uh, do how how can we get the experience or the the, the required uh, you know the required uh, skills? Uh, it's it's more or less like a head starting. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, captive I mean, breeding. it's uh, you know captive captive breeding pro yeah, yeah, captive breeding programs are, are are done all over the world, and I think we can learn from others um, their best practices. Just one more, two more things. One is a question. Um, you, you mentioned climate change and elevation being an issue. Um, are there areas that are higher elevation that are better suited because of climate change to uh, allow the species to survive? In other words, is it, is, it a, is it a temperature thing because of elevation? It's cooler they like, or is it rainfall? Or is it the, um, the, uh, the food they eat, they feed, they, they feed on? Yeah, I, I think it's more related to to foliage. Is the the food that they feed on? Um, okay. Uh, I, I think that the it's uh, it feeds on tiny uh, tiny tiny insects, uh, and I think they are more found on high elevated areas. So the effect okay. of climate change, uh, the warming, and all that perhaps, but we are not uh, we have not done much on this, so we cannot uh, certainly say so much. About it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The, the only last thing I would say is I'll talk to my colleagues, but I would be very interested in putting a program together at uh, ABC to um, find a way to save the species with uh, a captive breeding program, if necessary, at a higher elevation level. But yeah. I'll work with our experts to, to see that. But could you think about what it would cost to do that effectively? 
and I will yeah. try to bring the people together to um, to review it and then um, to get a sponsor to come in and, uh, and support it. That that would be really great. And I will, thank you so much for that. I will talk to to the team and, and see and discuss about this. Um, I, I think that our greatest fear is um, that we don't want to attempt, you know, given the number, the remaining number, we want to do something that we are sure that will be successful. So we really want to to prepare, you know, to be be prepared on this. So that once we start uh, this program, we are sure that we'll have a success story. And uh, and that yeah. team is committed. We will discuss about this and get back to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Lawrence. Thanks, Wesley. Um, I'm going to move us forward in the interest of time. Um, and uh, because we have quite a few talks to to, to get through, um, but we will come back to questions after the next talk, and then um, we we need to give plenty of time to hear from um, the, our colleagues in Cabo Verde as well. Um, Samuel, are, are you able to share your screen? And then we will move straight on to Samuel Bakari's talk on the Sharp's Long Claw of Kinnengott Plateau. Thank you very much. You. Wonderful. Well, uh, thanks so much and greetings, uh, everyone. I also want to take this early opportunity to, uh, to salute uh, uh, familiar faces and, and friends, and also want to thank you, Paul, and the ABC team uh, and members for the invitation uh, to talk about our conservation work. And also maybe quickly confirm uh, if uh, everyone can hear me or I am heard. You're loud and clear, Sam. Thanks. Uh, so I'm just trying to see if I can manage to run. Great. Uh, so my uh, quick talk is about the Sharps Long Club. Uh, this is uh, uh, another bird that is also endemic to Kenya uh, with a very, uh, you know, sm uh, or rapidly reducing population as a good preference for high land grasslands. And uh, I also must uh, mention that these grasslands are in the privately owned land and only a very, very few range of the grasslands are or fall within the protected uh, Yes, This work uh, is a continuation of works uh, that we have been doing together with uh, a number of my colleagues. Uh, I want to start with the range and distribution of this um, uh, grassland bud, the sharp front loop. You can see, although not very clear, this is a uh, grub, but you can see the green marks. Uh, this is where the, the species occurs, uh, mostly on the east and west of the Rift Valley and on the extreme lights uh, dotting around Mount Kenya on an ergon in, in the neighboring uh, Uganda. Uh, and this is how we can see them closely. But of course, if you look closer, um, this is how those green uh, mark looks like uh, if you if you zoom in, and of course then it means uh, even though the range appears big, if you zoom in, it is even much smaller, and there is a lot of uh, dynamics in these in these uh, ranges, as you can see in one of our grasslands or, or one of the uh, areas that we have uh, sharp strong uh, still occurring. You can see all the neighbor neighboring farms a lot of activities are happening. So really, uh, just to highlight that, yes, even though the range appears broad, then of course the area that uh, remains a suitable habitat uh, is, is really small. Uh, of course, uh, one of the key things that we have, uh, we, we highlight is, of, uh, is a big decline of the grasslands uh, cover. And as you can see, uh, some work has been done. Um, uh, and from 1990, I think this is where we started to have uh, big declines of uh, grasslands and uh, alongside tussocks. Uh, good to mention that the species uh, prefers a mix of uh, open grasslands that uh, has either box or higher grassland uh, or higher grass uh, box uh, or tussocks. So this, these tussocks provide uh, good uh, positions for breeding, but also uh, standing and observing uh, enemies. And I think also we can associate uh, the main drop uh, with the with the fall of grasslands in the 1995s. Uh, I think uh, the big aspect that happened here was actually the downfall of uh, government parastatos, which was supporting uh, livestock farming uh, 
And then this led to a big change in terms of activities from the traditional open grazing uh, to crop uh, cultivation, because then uh, a number of um, parastatos were successively supporting uh, you know, production of uh, and marketing of rice stock uh, products. And this uh, actually has, um, uh, you know, marks the big decline in terms of the grasslands. Uh, the, 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 the graph also shows the, the, the predictions in terms of the, the sizes. You can see that uh, big farms, which are suitable, are going down uh, in terms of uh, since 1995, and smaller farm holdings are, are going up. So these are some of the major dynamics that uh, we have uh, observed. Of course, we know quite a number of, of things in regards to these uh, birds. Uh, and um, we know that uh, we know what it prefers. Uh, a number of uh, research has been done uh, in terms of uh, habitat and uh, uh, selection. We also know the, the extent to which, of course, as we have seen, the, the habitat, the suitable habitats are, are declining. We also know, uh, you know, how the landscape is, uh, as I had mentioned. Uh, uh, we 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 are looking at a species that is in uh, privately owned uh, owned land. However, uh, I think in terms of the population, uh, we have um, we have had strong long-standing uh, records of um, at uh, bird life database that indicated that um, we have uh, between ten thousand and twenty thousand species, but we did lack. Uh, and these were estimates that were done in 2000. And, and looking at the grasslands decline, we lacked really proper um, estimates. Uh, and I think uh, this is what uh, this work uh, was uh, was doing, or this uh, this I'm talking about. And this has been supported uh, largely by ABC and the and the NABU. Uh, this is the German uh, bird rights partner. Of course, we have the understanding of the of the threats uh, as highlighted here, and mostly the main threat is the loss of habitat through grassland conversion, and uh, of course we have a number of uh, factors attributing to that. Uh, of course, the fact uh, that the population, human population, is growing, is increasingly putting pressure on the on the land, uh, change of land use as I as I had mentioned, and uh, of course upcoming uh, you know. Uh, Exotic uh, plantations, particularly eucalyptus, putting a lot of pressure on the on the grasslands. Of course, we have other uh, environmental uh, issues. I've, I've mentioned about uh, this um, uh, population estimates, and uh, in 2000, uh, Karioki predicted that uh, all, all sub, uh, observed that only 50 percent of the grasslands uh, remaining by then, and only 58 percent of the 50 was suitable for sharp long growth, but also further predicted that uh, by 2010, only less than 10% of the original grasslands would remaining based on the trajectory. Uh, Massey uh, and I also made observation that uh, by 2014, already less than 10% uh, of the grasslands were remaining, confirming uh, Kariuki's uh, prediction. And uh, so we, we did uh, look at a number of uh, sites and this is, uh, you know, included uh, Mao. Uh, this is uh, western, uh, west of Rift Valley, North Kinangop, and South Kinangop, east of Rift Valley, and Olkarao, and then Timau area. So we, we visited a number of uh, of grasslands which we had uh, known uh, prior their their presence. And uh, this is how this is our observation. So we visited a total of uh, three thousand uh, acres. Um, And uh, we also predicted about what uh, area of coverage uh, that we did cover, and also the number of sharp slope we, we counted. So in total, we counted uh, 1,200, uh, and our coverage was estimated to be about 72%. So we put an estimate of uh, 1,700 individuals of sharp slope along the uh, across the country and also the global population. So we put this, uh, the population to be less than 12. Of course, uh, we also uh, observed what are the, the pressures. And as you can see, um, uh, in, 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 North, in South Kinangop, we have high, high, high pressures in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what are the threats that we observed. Uh, we, we observed 
only in one area in Timau that we observe that the pressures are, are, are really low. And also must mention that this is one of the areas that we only have a very few farms, but uh, very, very well designed uh, farms where a large, uh, yeah, you know, farmers own big tracts of land. Uh, of course, you can see from this uh, image that this species is not only uh, being impacted by large uh, predators, but also uh, relatively small predators like the schleich here. So the the, the threats, of course, uh, really much, matches those of the tight Paris. Nonetheless, uh, I think we, we also have a good, um, good story to talk about. In Kinangop, we have uh, initiated a conservation model in realization that most of the farmers or most of the areas where we had uh, these uh, sharp long crow remaining and especially grasslands remaining is areas where we have farmers practicing sheep, uh, open sheep grazing. And uh, so we observed uh, an opportunity in terms of working with the farmers who are doing this. And what we have uh, been doing is to support the production of, of sheep and then also uptaking uh, uh, product from this uh, from the sheep, particularly wool, and then uh, you know through the market opportunity add value to the wool into products that are being sold and, and being used by people, uh, creating an opportunity for our youths and also at the same time uh, uh, improving livelihoods for for farmers, but of course with the with the big goal of uh, preserving and conserving the the highland grasslands, and um, we are looking at if this could be scaled also across lanes in uh, in Mau Timau in Mau Moro Timau grasslands, where we also know that um, most of the grasslands that are remaining, uh, the main uh, uh, agricultural activities uh, is sheep grazing. Of course, uh, we we have to worry about other things that we are not sure of. Uh, of course, it also faces similar challenges as the Taita Paris uh, Lawrence has talked about. We really have to worry about the issue of inbreeding. Of course, we have seen that the remaining uh, grasslands are really uh, uh, isolated, are uh, getting smaller, and we we know for sure that this species is not really known to move from you know for long distances. Uh, we are not sure of their breeding success, but in 2006, 2000 and 2004, 2006, uh, we did an observation of uh, breeding, and it was one of the least successful breeders in the in the grasslands compared to other grassland birds, uh, particularly the grassland pipit and and the lax. Of course, there are other issues that we have also to think about. Uh, there is a big discussion about the the Afri 100. Everybody, uh, particularly in Kenya now, is talking about uh, planting trees. There are a lot of ambitions to planting trees, and more often, uh, we, we find that uh, grasslands are looked at areas that are opportunity for, for planting trees. So this is um, an opportunity that is coming for landscape restoration, but at the same time, it is very likely to put pressure on the existing grasslands. So there is that other angle that we also have to, to think about. And I, uh, I want also to thank um, uh, you know the entire team and uh, and number of partners whom we have been working with uh, over the years. And uh, yes, uh, thanks so much. I uh, wanted to be brief and yeah, or welcome questions. Thank you so much, Samuel. Um, that was a, a lovely talk about one of my favorite birds um, and uh, really appreciate that. And that was a very clear, uh, both, both of your talks, very, very clear explanations of the problems and some of the uh, attempts that are being made to uh, conserve these species. Um, I think because we are running uh, quite late, um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to um, I'm going to move on to our next set of talks. And then if you can hold your questions, because I know you know some people may have to leave, and I want them to be able to to see the talks. But we will hold the questions, and then um, if you're if you're both able to hold on, um, then we can uh, answer any questions um, at the end of the session. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, so I'm going to um, move us now westwards uh, into the Atlantic Ocean to Cabo Verde and uh, very pleased to have uh, two speakers from the uh, Biosphera who are the um, relatively new BirdLife partner in Cabo Verde um, doing some really important work 
and uh, we're going to hear about some of the um, the work that uh, Biosphere have been doing with uh, particularly uh, around sort of the coasts of the um, the islands of the Cabo Verde. Um, so we've got, first of all, Nadina Rodriguez, who is the uh, executive director of Biosphera, um, and she is a graduate and a master's graduate in uh, business management and international study from the um, the uh, Centre for Professional Integration and Internationalisation in Cabo Verde. She's been involved with Biosphera since 2014, uh, working as, as finance and HR director, and she took over from uh, and she took over as executive director last year. And then we will also have Isabel Fortes, who is the uh, the manager of the the bird the bird program uh, for for Biosphera. Um, she is, has an MSc in ecology from the University of Coimbra in Portugal, and has been involved with Biosphera since 2012, working as a volunteer and then coordinating uh, some of the seabird programs. So welcome, Nadina and. Um, uh, Isabel, I hope you're able to um, share your screen and uh, we look forward to hearing from you this morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Nadina. I am director of Biosphere. This is my colleague Isabel Forte. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, thank you for uh, this opportunity to do a presentation about um, orts of Biosphere and to know those African clubbers. Biosphere is uh, an environment NGO in Cape Verde. We are the bird life partner in Cape Verde are, and are the base in San Vicente. Our mission is to uh, defend the conservation of coastal and marine species and their habitats and to mobilize our civil society in Cape Verde to protect the environment. We are, uh, we are the 28 uh, staff permanent and uh, 3,000 volunteers for each season for conservation work. Uh, we work in the protected marine areas of Santa Luzia, Raso and Branco, Santo Antão, São Vicente and San Nicolau. In the Santa Luzia, we work the biodiversity conservation in desert and protected islands. And uh, Santo Antão, Santo Luzia, Santo Antão, San Vicente, San Nicolau, we hold biodiversity conservation and education, environment education. There are um, other environment conservations on the other islands, and we are the partners on different conservation proje projects. Our strangers, uh, Biosphere, have uh, 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 two car and the boat, uh, seven uh, worlds, international and national, and uh, we have a good relationship with the median of Cambridge. Our stranger have the five objectives. First, uh, ensuring the conservation of coastal and marine species, protect marine and coastal habitats, you do for marine pollution, motivate the public to take a proactive role in the protecting the environment, and ensuring that Biosphere is a leading organization in the environment conservation. Now uh, I am introduce a little uh, change for the conservation. First, uh, ensure coastal and marine species uh, conservation. Here, we all the endemic species introduction, seabirds and sea turtles monitoring and protecting, and sharking monitoring. Next challenge is the protect coastal and marine habitats. We do involve uh, 12 fishing boats in a responsible and certified local fishing. Encourage cave guardians to consume sustainable trout, trout fish and support local fish and respect the environment. Another uh, challenge is to reduce marine pollution. Uh, here, we organize beach clean campaigns in the Santa Luzia and San Vicente, transforming and recycling plastic with the local communities uh, and to promote the circular economy. Involve Involve pollution in garbage collecting. Another challenge is 
inform, encourage, and mobilize collective censorship for the environment. Here, we do a school evidence campaigns, creation and broadcasting of television programs, and uh, involve community in the uh, evidence and conservation activities. Last one, uh, Biosphere Insert the Dead is the cutting edge organization in the environment conservation. Uh, we do create, we create and strengthen partnership with national companies. Biosphere is the member of BioLife International and EUCN and of stranger existing relationship with the partners. Uh, now, um, is the our main challenge is the bycatch by industrial fleet, fall chip, predation by invasive species and dog, lack of interest against marine pollution, lack of control and repression of illegal practices, lack of involvement and witness of the authorities. Uh, about biosphere itself, so now Isabel will talk about the seabird conservation. Thank you for attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel, and I'm the coordinator of our program, our program here in Biosphere. So, about conservation, birds for birds conservation. Here, we work with several groups of birds, uh, for example, coastal birds like osprey, that we do monitoring uh, the nest. Um, during the breeding season, we work to with migratory birds, uh, also terrestrial birds like, like Hazulaku, uh, which uh, until 2018 was confined only to the Hazo Island. And now you can find in some of the island to uh, do to, uh, do, do to its reintroduction. So since then, we have been monitoring the population to see the evolution of the species. Uh, finally, we work with marine uh, birds. Uh, that's our focus. Uh, about target bird species. Um, in Cabo Verde, we have uh, nine species of breeding, uh, of breeding uh, seabirds, and we work with seven of them. And four are endemic to Cabo Verde. That you can you can see in the in the slide. So um, here too, you can see uh, in San Jose Island, you can find just one species, the Cabo Storm Petter. In Hazo Island, you can find uh, almost all of them, except Face Storm Petter that you can find in Hazo, in Branco Island. And the last, the last bird species, uh, it's not breeding, breeding uh, of Cabo Verde, but uh, since 2013, uh, so since 2013 um, has been observed, uh, but we had no confirmation of breeding success uh, until now. About our, about our uh, study area, here's the activities are mainly carried out in the marine protected area of San Lucia and Hazo and uh, Branco Island. Um, so it's home to the most important colony of Calvertia water and important colony of six other uh, seabird species. And uh, compared to Branco and Hazo Island, it supports a low number of breeding seabirds, even their, uh, their probably, probably uh, were extensive colonies in the past. About um, Hazo Island, um, it's the place that you can find most of the seabird uh, breeding in Cape Verde. Uh, it's an habitat and an integral uh, natural reserve. You can find six species of breeding there, and it is also a resting place for unknown breeding species like boobies or gannets. And uh, the most important uh, Shawati colony is found on Hazo. Uh, about our activities, Biosphere, in partnership with other NGOs, has been carrying out uh, several conservation activities, such as monitoring breeding birds, as well uh, as some uh, scientific studies so that we can establish better conservation methods. 
The Sherwater uh, was the fourth seabird species uh, to be regularly monitored and protected by the Sherwater. In the past, chicks were catched in large uh, numbers on the on Haas and Barack Island for food, but this practice was banned thanks to the effort uh, of the Sherwater and the other NGOs uh, since 26. The conservation activities we carry out in Haso and uh, Bram and Santa Lucia Island uh, are monitoring the nest to evaluate the breeding success for all, all of the species that you find there. Um, for example, in Haso, uh, we have some nest uh, market, and one uh, once for week, we follow the nest to see the eggs or chick. Uh, until the during the breeding season, uh, other activity that we that we do uh, is uh, building artificial nets for some species, especially in Branco Island and San Lucia. But these activities it's uh, it's very important because it has so in Branco Island uh, during the breeding uh, season of turtle they destroyed the the some nets of um, of some species like um, weight faces so better weight faces better uh, that's why we construct or build the, build the the nest for increase the breeding area activities in um, winning or recapture birds in net in net or a uh, true vertical net in net or true vertical nets for studies and analyze of the evolution uh, of the species. This activity uh, we focus more in small, uh, when we put, how is it, when we put uh, vertical nets, we focus more in small birds like stone pet because they are uh, very small, so sometimes it's too hard to reach the nest. So this so we do uh, individual sense to estimate the population size uh, each five years for all of the species. And uh, this is very important because um, give us an idea of how the population is doing. So for example, the Campeche water, which uh, used to be catched by fishermen for food on the Hazoil, has seen a sharp decline in its population. Today, some of the eight ex hunter work to get together with Biosphere on the conservation. Um, census have been carried out every five years since 2014 with uh, the help of the fishermen community. In June, uh, in June of 2018, uh, there were an estimate almost 7,000 breeding pairs of show water in Hazo. And in Branco uh, Island, there were um, an estimate 2,000 uh, breeding pairs, 2,000 breeding pairs. So, and um, in these years, um, we had an estimated almost 9,000 uh, breeding pairs on Hazo Island. So for us, it's um, the, the result is very satisfactory uh, because uh, so we can see the population grow and it's a gain for our biodiversity, uh, especially in Hazo Island. So, uh, and the last activity that we do in Hazo, in Hazo Island, it's uh, putting put GPS loggers on the back of the birds. Uh, we work with um, all of the the birds that you can find, except the uh, strong pet because it's too small. So, like I said before, sometimes uh, you you can find the nest or uh, reach the, the birds inside the nest. So we work with the other species. We put GPS for one week or one or two weeks. And uh, then we, when the, the shell water backs or the other species back, back to the nest, we we take the GPS and the um, so and analyze the data, and the results showed that during the incubation period, uh, they can travel to the West African coast, but during the chick 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 breeding period, it stays in the waters of Cape close to the colony because they need to feed the the chicks. 
So it's important they uh, keep in the water or, or close off the columns of the babies. And to com complete these uh, these activities, we collect we collect some biological sample um, for study of of diet for all of the species too. Sorry, um, this uh, in this slide you can see uh, some results that we got uh, by GPS loggers. Uh, we have um, almost all, or, or all of the species here. You can see, for example, boobies, uh, they they like to stay close the the, the colony, but sure waters or strong petal, uh, bulberry's petal like to, to go far, like uh, West, West African coast. Yeah. Uh, and to complete our activities uh, with birds, we have developed many awareness raising campaigns, uh, for example, in schools, uh, in summer camps, um, uh, in communi communities, many fish, fish, fishing communities, uh, with militaries and police. Uh, sometimes we do some uh, activities uh, about world migratory birds, exhibition um, on different islands that we, we we talk about birds especially. Um, we have now made a television television program on uh, subject of uh, of the environment. A documentary with different star from Cap Verde talking about our diversity, and you can find two in the YouTube. Uh, and finally, uh, some we have uh, environmental music, environmental music and play for uh, children and teenager, uh, and a little book for uh, children that. Um, we talk about uh, our biodiversity, especially in um, Maria Bucetti area of San Jose and Branco. Branco and Hazuaire too. So, so that's all for um, Conservancy Steeper here in the Sphere. If you have any question or doubts, you can, you can feel free and uh, ask us. Thank you.